in accordance to the topic of the meeting, ecological and social dimension of tropical biodiversity conservation, I have the honor to introduce to Dr. Alonso Aguirre, who has developed an integral perspective of the environmental problem in the concept of conservation medicine and One Health. This concept encompasses the social, ecological, and health dimension of our ecological problems and involves interdisciplinary research as well as the constant interaction with the different political, social, and economical spheres. For the past three decades, he has worked over 23 countries focusing, focusing on integrative research, transdisciplinary, and leadership professional courses and capacity building. Currently, Dr. Alonso Aguirre is a chair and professor at the Department of Environmental Science and Policy at George Mason, Mason University, Virginia, where he had a program of collaborative research that focused on the ecology of wildlife disease and the links to human health and conservation of biodiversity. He also shared the University Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. In the past, he served as the executive director of the Smithsonian Mason School of Conservation, and previously, he was senior vice president of EcoHealth Alliance, co-leading Predit, a multi-million dollar initiative funded by USAID. Dr. Aguirre also co-founded the Emerging Discipline of Conservation Medicine and is senior editor of both seminal books. His most recently book is Tropical Conservation Perspective on Local and Global Priorities, and he has published over 160 peer-reviewed uh, papers, articles. He also co-founded the journal EcoHealth and the International Association of Ecology and Health. Additionally, he has advised government of several countries in the Americas, Southeast Asia, and Western Europe. He also has briefed the U.S. and Mexican Congresses. For his outstanding trajectory, Dr. Aguirre has received numerous awards, including the Colorado State University Warner College of Natural Resources Distinguished Alum Award, the Harry Halanka Memorial Medal for Finland for outstanding contribution to wildlife medicine and the conservation, the Award of the Year from the Mexico State Commission of Natural Park and Wildlife for his role in conserving protected area for monarch butterflies. In the same sense, his work has been the focus of extensive media coverage, including bioscience, conservation in practice, in magazines, environmental health perspective, National Geographic, The New York Times, Science New, Trend in Ecology and Evolution, Newsweek, National Public Radio, Al Jazeera Stream, TV, CBS, LTV, and other international magazines, TV, and radio shows. Then, it is a pleasure for me to have Alonso with us presenting the tall entitled Conservation Medicine and One Health Addressing the Change Threats of Disease Emergency, Globalization, and Climate Change for, to Tropical Biodiversity. Thank you, Alonso, for being here Thank and you, enjoy Daniel. it. Thank you. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? I was expecting just Daniel and, and uh, he, his wife showing up to the talk, so it's fantastic. I should confess it is the first time at uh, your meeting, and I really appreciate uh, Dr. Luis and his group for his kind invitation. And, and I feel really humbled to, to uh, he, I don't know, he read a part of the bio that I gave him, he read the whole thing, <laughs> instead of keeping short. But uh, despite uh, some accomplishments, I realized that, that how disconnected we are. And, and so I asked uh, Moises, a postdoc with uh, the University of Michoacán, to do a quick search in, in the program for basic terms. 
so, so he looked at health 17 times, only twice outside my talk. Disease nine times, once outside my talk. Zoonosis, not mentioned. Antibiotics, not mentioned. Contaminants, not mentioned. I know parasites were mentioned in the context of uh, ecological systems, but not actual disease or effects on populations. So, therefore, I changed my whole talk to leave your ego at home and learn to listen. And we've been, we've been uh, because you guys know what's happening with climate change, you know what's happening with biodiversity loss, we know what's happening with all the trickle-down effects of human populations affecting the planet. And so I'm just going to highlight a few things. The new book that he already said, buy it, is fantastic. It took me 10 years to get it out. 70% uh, of contributions are from biodiverse countries. Uh, it was a hell to edit academic English for those people. But got done. All positive cases of changing conservation in a very nice way. So it's out there. And why, why the clouded leopard? I hate the image of uh, charismatic megafauna, always lions, panthers, tigers. Everybody wants to work on that. I get emails every month of students. I want to work with little kitties. I want to work with tigers. Well, I decided to go with clouded leopards first because um, that's a large population. The largest population of clouded leopards in, in, the, in the U.S. is a Smithsonian Institution where I was based for three years when I was running the School of Conservation. And um, then to learn that none of those cats, they call it sustainable populations, but none of those cats are going to be released into the wild ever. So we manage the books for all these captive animals in the US, Canada, and all other European countries that will never be released into the wild. So then we start questioning the roles of zoos, the rules of these programs long term. But I decided to go for a clouded leopard. If you look at the, uh, the range, uh, I think it's the point, yeah. This is the, the um, uh, historical range, the Formosa and clouded leopard extinct. Uh, that's th um, Taiwan. And then, then it wasn't until 2006 that we found out that it's a different species and not a subspecies. It's how little we know of our diversity even with large individuals. So that's why that's a part of the cover. So Dr. Lovejoy, Tom Lovejoy, the father of the term biodiversity and one of our faculty, uh, George Mason, sent me this slide. He said, I'm just thinking about you and, and looks like you're just sitting there. I don't smoke, but I always love to have a good wine. Okay, nice library. Looking at the planet, can I change what's happening now globally? Well, and then here, Dr. Planet just thinking about uh, what to do when the whole planet is melting under his feet, right? And it's all about collaborations. And that's why he decided to change the perspective of this talk. And actually, I started with my first uh, wildlife experience back in um, 19, 1987, when I started my PhD at Colorado State University. And one month into the program, I was contacted by Guy Baldassari. Uh, now now he, he died a few years back. And he's rather a student, a professor at Oregon State now, uh, Dick Schmidt, on a die of, of um, American flamingos here in Celestun. So we flew down. And it was just interesting to see all these birds dying of lead poisoning. Of course. Uh, Semarnat, at the time, I don't know if it was called Semarnat, got involved as a wildlife agency in Mexico. We had to say it was Newcastle disease, not lead poisoning, because lead was going to legislation to be switched into steel. Two papers came out of it in the sense that we said, yeah, it was lead poisoning, we found Newcastle disease antibodies, but there were some circ um, environmental circumstances that were killing all these birds, probably we lost about 500 in that outbreak. And those work out the first uh, times where actually biologists reach out to, to a veterinarian. And so, and that's one of the messages. 
Um, Luis already mentioned I've been working in about 23 countries globally uh, trying to deal with health and disease of these species. Uh, Michael Koch, a veterinarian good friend of mine, sent this photo and he said, this is one health, this conservation medicine, when you look at how 60% of the people on the planet live, look at these interactions. Obviously, on all these interactions, one pathogen or more than one are going to jump species. And so I was surprised to see how few talks were given in this uh, forum to look at the impacts of pathogens in ecosystems, in humans, animals, and populations in general. And so we know this issue that was brought up by Rodolfo Dirso, by several of you have been talking about something we keep evading, as we call the, the bull by the horns, and that's population growth, human population growth. And depends on how you want to look at it, probably we should move to Africa, right? We need 43 Africans to produce the, the ecological footprint of one American, according to some measures. But that population growth continues. Also, we talked about nutrition. Over almost 5,000 calories are being produced and still 1 billion people are starving. And, and you can see that over time, after the, the um, actual industrial revolution, that's when things change. Antibiotics showed up, and we thought, well, now we have control disease. And we can see that geometric increase supposed to level up at 10 billion. But you can see changes from expanding settlements to, to uh, sorry, to um, domestic animal production, domestication, 10,000 years ago, and then crops, and eventually, we are, crops are not enough. We got to extract natural resources worse than ever now. We thought we could deal with elephant uh, uh, poaching about 20 years ago when leaky burned out a bunch of ivory that didn't work. And now something that the panel this morning failed to mention uh, on the failure of societies, yes, but now we're dealing with organized crime, a uh, multi-billion dollar industry that's going to be very hard to control. So even regulations at the level we're talking are going to be totally useless to do something about that. So we have to think about in different ways to approach this crisis. And then all this has led to what we talked as increasing animal, oops, sorry, animal human contact and spillover. And that's the issue. It's not wildlife, well, let's kill all the bats because they're full of viruses. It's just beyond that. So during these conversations, so this, uh, at least a few of the papers I attended through the conference, and I've been here every day here and there, but we looked at ecosystem services heavily, absolutely land use change as a main cause of extinction, a main cause of interactions, food safety, obesity, malnutrition, anthropogenic contaminants have been mentioned, but zoonotic disease, antibiotic resistance, treatment control and prevention of these diseases, harmful algal blooms, and many other issues were not mentioned yet. We know we're on this unsustainable rate. Uh, we have seen events never seen before. And I tell you, this was brought by Rostrom several times in our conversations here. And we know by diversity is the one that's way over. However, a different picture of the same. You can see biodiversity gone amok with nitrogen cycle and phosphorus cycle. Of course, climate change has passed boundaries. But guess what? Somebody talked about the impact of contaminants. We don't even know how contaminants are impacting species or ecosystems. At least 150,000 substances have been released in the biosphere, and only 5%, maybe 10% can be measured in the lab. So we don't know the soup of contaminants that species are being exposed to over time. So really, the drivers of these extinctions and changes in wildlife populations include the classical main cause of extinction, habitat fragmentation, right, deforestation. Uh, a new term that came about in 2000 by Dashak and others, pathogen pollution. Now, it's not only 
pathogens taking over a population, but now being moved around by humans and their animals and their transport over time and causing disease. Some term that I came up a few years back in the second book of conservation medicine, global toxification, and it's not only releasing the contaminants, but now the movement of those contaminants across the planet, now being found everywhere. The first case was DDT in penguins many years ago, and we have many examples of that. I don't have to go into it. Of course, globalization, urbanization, and what we deny still climate, global environmental change or climate change. Of course, now we're finding biodiversity makes a difference. Yet, we, we need to find a balance with the New York City and the Congo Basin and in between Brasilia, right? How can we uh, provide uh, those issues? And, and maybe you saw the, the CC, uh, the BSC, the B, BSC news uh, recently, just two days ago, saying that we have lost 50% of the bird race in the planet. In fact, it's an older report from World Life Fund looking at the Living Planet Index, and the most recent report shows that 48 to 66%, an average of 58% of the global bird race have been lost. We're talking in 40 years, 1970 to 2014, 2012. And so it's a massive loss of uh, biodiversity globally. There's some criticisms about this, but we don't have other data to compare to. And we can see that obviously when we have in the 70s, uh, mil over millions of elephants now, that's 400,000 left. And these are the percentages just to show you uh, biodiversity loss from 40% terrestrial species, 80% amphibians, and freshwater, over 40% marine. So there are massive losses. The old paradigm of protected areas, of course, doesn't work. It never worked. That was last century approach. Uh, I show Costa Rica it has 20% of their land protected for, for conservation or uh, some type of ecotourism. And that hasn't uh, provided the protection that we need throughout time. And in uh, our latest book, we published something that we call sort of situ, sort of in between. We're applying ex situ techniques. Ideally, we want to work in situ with wildlife populations living in unlimited space and resources. Well, forget it, that's not happening anymore. In fact, I was sent to this country to get a master's a zoo vet, and I, I was totally reluctant to be a zoo vet. I said, I want to work with wildlife, not with zoo animals, because what I see in the zoos is the wrong nutrition, they're picking up diseases from humans and other species across. They're not in their natural environment, and they're stressed out as hell. Well, guess what? I, I became a mega zoo vet, because that has happened now in the wild. We're concentrating species in smaller spaces, and we're dealing with the same issues of captivity. So, so ex situ, of course, has been very useful uh, long term for many biologists, veterinarians, and, and field people, because that's what we learn about that species, anatomy, physiology, maybe drugs that can work, maybe how to get a blood sample. Takes a while to figure out how to get a blood sample for species. And so we have removed those species from nat natural habitat, but maybe they provide an experience to the general public. What we're dealing now, I think, is the sort of city approach. Sort of situ is the reality of overseeing of populations of wildlife managed as continuum on this available space and, and maybe uh, approaching ways of non-native and native habitat. And that's what I tell um, uh, the students here, the new generation, you have to become very good at something but start working in teams. That's the only way we're going to solve these issues. Uh, a formula that I started working back in 88 with my colleagues of ecology at Colorado State, and they told me I was crazy. It was that I will tell them disease impacts populations to a point that they're not just additive to, to what's happening to health. What we're seeing now is that stress, whatever the stress is, let's say, 
let's say, any environmental factor like contaminants will lead to immunosuppression and that's going to lead to disease. What we're seeing now, that disease is the last break leading a species to extinction. And now all those old friends that were against working with disease, all them and their students want to work on disease ecology. And I was surprised we don't have a disease ecology section in this meeting, but that's where I'm going to go next. Uh, so health seems very easy concept to, to define, right? Health connects all species in the planet, but it's very complex. So if you look at how we measure health here uh, in the U.S. compared on a kid from the U.S. overweight with all resources, with somebody from Ethiopia, another kid the same age from Ethiopia, which is healthier, or what will be actually healthy. So it depends. And that's why it's such a subjective term, but we gotta set up our baselines, and that depends on the population you're working on. Conservation medicine came in the, in the 90s, when I started working with Wildlife Trust. Ecosystem health was a term already used by Rapport and Constanza. The problem with ecosystem health was totally anthropocentric. They were looking about human health, community health, agricultural health, ecosystem health. I said, no, we have to move biotic health, animal health plants, human health to the side, and we end up calling this ecological health. Was a more fluid term that now a lot of people refer to One Health or Eco Health, if you will. Um, two books that were mentioned, uh, published in the last uh, 10 years, 15 years. The first one uh, looking at three circles, and the other ones with cases. Two more books came later on in 2003 on Eco Health. So we have the, the scientific basis for these fields, but yet not enough. And you can download this uh, through the internet if you're interested. Uh, it wasn't until 2013 that One Health showed up with three books, uh, 13, 14, and 15 different editors. Totally, they took the diagrams for conservation medicine, and, and this was not even mentioned in these books. But that's not the point. There's uh, organizations getting together, World War Life, uh, the World Health Organization, World Organization for Animal Health, and FAO trying to set up a framework for One Health. And there's a commission, a One Health Academy, working in, in bringing scientists from several disciplines to work together. International conferences, uh, the last one just happened last uh, December in Australia. Interestingly, um, the same issue that we see probably in these conferences. Uh, and Emilio gave a very good talk showing the percentage of people being editors in journals, mostly uh, Europe and North America. Well, I can tell you in this conference, as supposed to be embracing people from all backgrounds, 70% of the speakers were white males over 60, over 50. So, welcome to the club, right? And if you're interested in One Health, is the One Health initiative for you to look into it. Uh, I think the main problem coming our way is antibiotic resistance. We have seen antibiotic resistance a major issue, uh, very nicely put by a professor at uh, Lance Price at George Washington University. The whole world is covering a thin layer of feces. And, and really, it's a microbial world. Uh, it's really, we're looking at the microbiome in a different way because all these interactions, 30% of the wildlife species brought to rehab, like wild birds, wild mammals, uh, show antibacterial resistance. And it's because we're dumping a massive amount of antibiotics in the planet. Why are, shall we be interested in this field? Well, number one, is because we gotta learn about from the guinea pig whoever he or she is, right? But we're seeing today that toxins, infectious diseases, or other agents first show up in humans, domestic animals, or wildlife, only to find later on that it will affect other, other groups. We're gonna find out that that pathogen that's supposed to be only in, in uh, wild animals are showing up in humans. And 
And, and the issue is how can we move fluidly from the molecular population to the ecosystem level across. The only way is collaborations. The only way is moving through these systems. And a question that I would like to ask, are we getting sicker today? Or is it just technology? Are there more diseases today than before just because we have better technology to measure those agents? And the answer, yes. We have more diseases, better technology, but also a lot more diseases. And that's because the way we change in this environment. In fact, uh, some numbers show that 75% of the diseases affecting humans today come from wildlife. And from those, uh, they are related to human activities. And that includes SARS, Nipah, Ebola, of course, and all related to human population growth in buffer protected areas near wildlife in the tropics. That's where we see huge emergence. Uh, this is a nice diagram that Gardner published in our book, uh, looking at the impact of these diseases depending on how these populations get stressed out. Eventually, they may lead to extinction, eventually not. And Smith published back, interestingly, this paper looking at the IUCN data looking at all extinctions that happened at the time. And then if you can see, these are the cause of extinction. Again, habitat we know is up there with our exploitation, invasive species, number one in islands, across taxa. But 32 of our 869 extinctions, less than 4%, uh, happen, happen mostly in amphibians, as you can see here. And that's because of the chytrid fungus. So probably that was the bias, but still not showing up. That's good that's being picked up at this level. Uh, I like to bring this case because I'm under collaboration. I know, I know the person, a graduate student still working with a professor, they went in that year back in 19, uh, I think, no, that was 2001, 2003. Uh, went in one year, dying frogs, dying uh, toads, the golden toad in Costa Rica, uh, with uh, some moribund, some healthy, no samples were collected. So we'll never know if it was a chytrid. If there was a team of scientists, maybe we had a different perspective on how to approach the disease. Uh, in fact, the species went extinct, and this is a different species, a telopus that went extinct uh, in different years. But we saw these multiple crashes all across the planet. We saw all these crashes happening in Australia, uh, going as a wave all the way from Costa Rica into Panama, Colombia. And, and the key factor was that the same scientists were moving the pathogen around. And that's what we have in their boots, carrying the fungus from Australia to Costa Rica and back. And so that's the evidence that we have. The first case that I used way back then was uh, the, the honey creepers in Hawaii, many of them extinct, as you can see here, uh, due to two pathogens, avian malaria and avian pox, uh, starting in the 50s, the first documentation in the 50s, what we know probably came as early as Captain Cook bringing mosquitoes into the island and then wiping up all these species uh, naive to the disease. Uh, the other famous case is the black footed ferret due to sylvatic plague, and of course, the first issue was distemper. First thought extinct, ferrets were found in Wyoming, brought into captivity, they started dying of canine distemper, never knew where they come from, but now relatively recovered, there's a vaccine, and that's a, a success story, actually, in these populations. And I've been working with this disease for over 20 years. Many papers continue saying it's a herpes virus. Well, herpes happens in any species. Probably it's a papilloma virus. I'm just waiting for a human to show up with these lesions so I can get the funding to say, yeah, this is a problem. But that's the issue with wildlife disease. Uh, there's no interest until humans are affected directly. Uh, we see massive de the, uh, decrease on pollinators. We see the issue of uh, Tasmanian devils showing tumors, and actually as a cell infection, 
Partula uh, tree snails, known extinct in captivity. And then, of course, the last case of the Wino syndrome in bats, killing uh, millions of bats, including two or three endangered species, due to also uh, a fungus now reclassified as a different species, but still causing massive mortality globally. The cause of these uh, bad declines are due to spelunkers coming from Spain into New York, bringing the fungus in their boots. And that's the closest thing that we can point the origin of this pathogen. So, so to be, how much time I have? Where's the timer? Oh, 15. Oh, I have 15 minutes. <laughs> we still have, well, I haven't got into the transdisciplinary. I just gave you a few examples of where we're going. Are we, are we looking at the health of the planet in the way that we should? And I can tell you we're totally disconnected. I was surprised of how few people I met. I mean, I knew this meeting before I came besides the very important people that, that already talk, and, and how humble I felt to see that, that amazing presentations related to ecology and conservation of tropical forests, and, and still we thought that we had an influence or a footprint in programs or, or, or um, research like, like yours. Uh, already mentioned this meeting again, we keep focusing in the problems. We need to move forward trying to find solutions. And that's something that uh, probably we won't do, but the young ones will start working on it. We really have to change our ways of thinking how to address these problems. We have to look in like the beer corporations, try to research the industrial complex, as we call it, really uh, look at bridge barriers that divide disciplines of knowledge, and that sounds easy. Empower not only institutions, but individuals to work together, something that American funding doesn't do. Slowly, it's trying to change, but uh, it's very difficult. And engage in translational ecological health sciences. Look at health. Health has to be somewhere within uh, looking at species and ecosystems. So we gotta go beyond the brand name. I told you already about terms like conservation medicine, ecological medicine, eco-health, one health, global health. Now it's a new one that Rockefeller Foundation is funding, multi-million dollars to Harvard, calling it planetary health, but I'm coming with interplanetary health. Hopefully we can get money enough to work with these issues, right? And, and so a few times transdisciplinarity has been mentioned here. I'm not sure in the context that we're thinking, but I, I was happy to see two or three papers mentioning transdisciplinarity. And that's basically what we see here is that uh, at least conservation medicine and One Health are transdisciplinary, and it's all about collaborations, really, uh, in the sense that, uh, and that's what we think, right? So this paper came all, all in 2011, looking at communication between wildlife bi biologists and health professionals in a disease outbreak in a national park or in a, in a protected area or just in the field. So interestingly, they show that wildlife professionals, veterinarians and biologists don't communicate at all. There's no communication. And then definitely nothing between this group with wildlife, wildlife management stakeholders and nothing with human health professionals. The only communication was identified in case of wildlife associated emerging diseases was from human health professionals to wildlife management stakeholders. It is how poorly we communicate with people that we're supposed to, but it's not happening. And so transdisciplinarity, and, and probably many of you already know where we're going with this, but I, I think it's worthwhile emphasizing that we're trying to do, we have the foundational knowledge. We have the know, we have also the act, the, what we call meta-knowledge from problem solving, communication, collaboration, creativity, but this is the part that we're missing and the social sciences reveal the humanistic knowledge, the, the ethical, emotional, cultural competence. And this is what actually brings 
transdisciplinary to a different level. Uh, we need to characterize the problems in the real world, global, and participatory. We need one health or, or biology or tropical biology or ecology to reflect the global community. And I'm so impressed on this community, but it's very global. It's probably the most global I've ever seen. And it's exciting to see that people from all over the world are at this meeting. Uh, the issue with trying to be transdisciplinary is that this is a picture that I see we have public health, domestic animal health, ecosystem health, plant and health. And then there's emerging infectious diseases, toxification, climate change, species declines and extinctions. This is what we call tra traditional disciplinary silos. Experts don't help one another. We just kind of talk about it within our circles. And at the end, those problems fall between the silos and are treated, they are not my problem. It's somebody else's problem. And that's, that's uh, an issue that we would like to change. So basically, we have to break down those silos somehow and try to come up with this picture. Um, and this is just a one health example, could be ecology, could be conservation, Li really communicating, bringing and training students together, south to south, something that we've been pushing for years and what's mentioned here in this meeting too. Uh, reconciling terms, terminology, our jargon is horrible. And then comparing and sharing data sets. Even with the U.S. government, we cannot compare data sets. Uh, USDA has a different uh, computer system than USGS and the Department of State and NOAA, and we cannot even bring data sets together to begin to make sense to all these data collected for years. We have to share our knowledge somehow. Uh, just to wrap up, I want to give you an example. Uh, I've been working for many years on the on the land uh, water interactions. We have seen many pathogens jumping species from uh, mar uh, terrestrial ecosystems to marine ecosystems. Um, if you want to know where I come from, I was born by Asuncion, by California, Mexico, little tiny uh, village. And that's probably one of the few sustainable fisheries in the world with a bulone and lobster because the way they work as a cooperative. And they're very tight about uh, bag limits. And so a uh, very unique ecosystem, a huge marine terrestrial biodiversity. 80% of the marine mammals in the Pacific come to feed here. You will never see anywhere else in the world seeing 40 blue whales feeding in one spot of Loreto Bay. Uh, so you can imagine the massive amount of resources available. Uh, what's happening to the oceans is contrary to my geography professor told me in junior high. Uh, she said the future humanity will be the oceans. And, and so I was so excited. Resources will never finish enough to take care of humanity for the rest of centuries. Well, we have taken too much we have put too much in, and we destroyed our coastal wilderness. Indeed, the oceans are in trouble. I told you about this program in Baja um, with the Marine Stewardship Council certification just for lobster and abulone too, but development is happening at a very high rate in this ecosystem. You can see now increasing in boats, interactions with wild animals, you can see now shrimp fisheries or shrimp farms develop fairly quickly and heavy impact on these ecosystems. And that's way back in about 2000 where the uh, um, President Fox wanted to set up what we call the, um, um, a major development in Baja. And, and we propose an, an ecological ladder, if you will, instead of a developmental one trying to see if we can develop a more green system. I got involved in this project uh, many years ago, about 2003, we started seeing stranded sea turtles in Bahia San Lazaro, south of Bahia Magdalena. The spot is right here, about 44 kilometers straight. 
um, we will see turtles stranding uh, to a point that every year these turtles will be collected in what we call the cemeteries. Uh, every year we have a cemetery up to a thousand turtles. Um, I had two veterinarians on site every summer to find out the cause of mortality. Uh, sea turtles are extremely important for people to the point that, that um, Garcia published back in 2000, they're part, uh, probably most important species in Baja due to economical, ecological, and cultural values. So they're very appreciated by people, but we still kill and eat 30,000 turtles every year around lentil time, lent time. And, and because these feasts are associated with family, tradition, virility, spirituality, and health, any way you want to see it, um, two main issues, we have the issue bycatch, the one I show you of uh, loggerheads, uh, many of those turtles are killed by fishing nets or the fishermen. And that's a tradition that's been going on for many years, generation by generation. But what about if we change the way we fish? And that has been the challenge, right? The other issue is by kill, intentional killing of sea turtles for human consumption. So based on those, uh, we know there's a huge sea turtle consumption. Jay Nichols, when he started his PhD setting up satellite tags, he lost three before uh, he even released the turtles. Well, when he released the turtles and those turtles were gone. And then he found these cemeteries there near Bahia Magdalena and realized that that's a massive consumption of turtles, very young turtles all the way to 50 years old, depending uh, on the poaching impacts. So he and another group, and I joined them uh, in late 1999 to set up the Sea Turtle Network of Californias, uh, bringing fishermen, their kids, and now scientists having every year a meeting to monitor sea turtles locally. So now we can tell fishermen, well, instead of bycatch, you know, killing turtles, why don't you use them as an ecotourism tool? Let's look at how your populations are doing. And this was just a photo of our meeting 2015. We started with six communities. Now we have a lot more of this and now they're in map already. But we have Bay City communities all across to Nayarit and Northern Jalisco here. Um, and, and everywhere across. Still consumption is happening. And so we ask a, a fisherman in Isla Holbox, actually that's not even near here actually, that's the Yucatan, and he said, since we were little kids, we were told how important it is to eat sea turtles. It's like you, you need to believe in the Virgin Mary, and then from one day to the next they tell you not to believe in her. And I can tell you I'm, I'm a proven, proof of that because my grandfather will bring sea turtles, a fisherman with two boats in Baja. He'll bring the sea turtle. The first thing we had to do is drink the blood raw. If you're lucky with a little lemon and salt. I wish there were some tequila on it. but And, and have it raw because what's good for your asthma and for your flu. And people still cannot do that. And then I found now there's 50, 70 different parasites in the blood of sea turtles. So now you, now you know why you end up this way, right? But you start thinking about uh, how can you change the cultural values of people? How can you change the perspective of, of being a consumer instead of protecting the resource? And that has been the challenge that I faced for many years. So we tried a campaign. We went back when Bush was a president, releasing these cards. Eating sea turtle makes you slow. This is a photo from the White House, actually. We, we, didn't, we didn't make it up. So let's see if that works. Well, that didn't work. So then, posters. The first one, a very controversial, that Semarnat and many government agencies have supported this famous uh, model from Argentina, Argentina Maris, uh, Doris Mar, and she says, my man doesn't need any sea turtle legs to perform. Please protect sea turtles. Well, that backfired, right? Because everybody thought, well, that's a joke. You're showing this pretty girl, and now you're telling me not to have any sea turtles. 
So actually, we did the analysis, and two sea turtle legs are exactly in content of protein, ashes, minerals, than one chicken egg. No difference. So we tried to push the chicken eggs, of course not. This photo I took in the aquarium in, in, in Costa Rica by the coast, and it says my eggs are not a solution. They Viagra. <laughs> and, and, and so well, maybe that would work. In fact, there was a paper in Science, I think, pushing for a Chinese to switch from uh, rhino horn and, and, and uh, tiger ospinos, uh, but I think it didn't work either. So maybe health may be a powerful motivator. I show this, the case of West Nile. Within three years, the disease hit New York and went across the whole continent, went rampant, killing hundreds of humans, making a lot of people sick, killed thousands of birds and wildlife. And so this network had to do not only with transparency, involvement, collaboration, but also trying to collect scientific data. So we started with workshops, trained the local capacity for 15, now 17 years, looking at materials via media, showing them books, trying to portray the resources in many ways with comics, TV. In fact, you may have seen this as you cross the Tijuana-San Diego border, these huge boards, don't eat a panda, would you eat a panda, would you eat a whale? Don't eat sea turtles. Uh, we tried a festival with a sea turtle um, uh, queen. Uh, just to conclude, I just want to say that uh, the loss of biodiversity of extinction one species doesn't affect only an ecosystem or doesn't affect a community alone, but also we lose a culture. And this happened actually in Tiburon Island this is Baja, this is Sonora, and Tiburon Island is here, where the Seri, uh, local natives, uh, native uh, American native culture lives. And they've been using sea turtles for centuries. And actually, that's the only population allowed to hunt sea turtles in Mexico for their own consumption. Uh, they, this is the last photo where a, a leather bag was seen, and that was used uh, in a religious purpose as sea turtles, uh, as this letter by looks like the island itself, uh, that's kind of their mother of their culture. And they do a shrine, they do a dance. They, they, in 2005, by this group, they decided to start a ceremony again because the young girls were losing the whole culture. They haven't seen a turtle in about 20 years. A bone was found from a leatherback, and that was used to start a ceremony with some hatchlings being released that year uh, with a very traditional Seri song related to the ocean, related to the sea, related to the wind, related basically to the contact with nature. Um, I'm going to skip this uh, too on how we deal with these issues. We have systems, we have data, we have scientists, we have the knowledge. We need to learn how to transmit it. We need to move uh, ecosystem-based management instead of species to species to species. We need to really look at also at climate change. And climate change already by itself predicts about 25% of species extinction. And we have known that for many species in the Arctic, like caribou, but we know with disease interactions, they're going to get worse. And we have seen it with Zika, with chikungunya, and with new pathogens coming up our way. Climate is at the center of these interactions. We need to continue surveillance, uh, look at impact ecosystems, but also try to change the attitude of humans to the environment. And, and I guess just to finalize, look at the 100 year one health mission is try to look at and save the ecological foundation of our planet, change inflection point of two things, human population growth and consumption, of course, and change of the inflection point of CO2. Maybe we can uh, set up a more sustainable glide path for human endeavor. Effective partnerships. You have to work with whoever you don't want to work. You better work. 
And then the Anthropocene choice. You can go ego or eco, depending on who you want to go to. And probably, um, I shouldn't list names, but sometimes they're useful to look at w which way you want to go. And thinking globally, acting locally, we always preach about, but we have to think locally and act in a global way to move forward. Thank you for your attention. I don't, I don't know if we have time for questions, but first I want to give this, this book to the organizer of this meeting, to Luis for his kind. Oh, he just left. Oh, so he's, but she will take it for, for him. And also I would like to propose uh, to, to the organizers for the next meeting, if a session on, on disease ecology, on one health conservation medicine could be part of your meeting. I think that will be useful to begin integrating um, bodies of knowledge. And also one, uh, talking to your organizers or your officers to bring some of you to our meetings. Thank you. Any questions? We got to go to the party. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's fun back there. Hi. Uh, I was thinking about this initiative in, in California to, well, enhance the protection of the tur turtles. Um, is there any initiative to promote those kind of initiatives, but like to um, coordinate this kind of action? Because this is the kind of action we may see in very remote areas. And the chance that, or the likeliness that this kind of initiative rises somewhere uh, is is difficult, but if there is like an association thinking of those things and, and targeting point by point and just recommending these things, uh, it, it may enhance the, um, how we find a solution to those animal health problems, for, for example. Uh, that's, a, that's a good point, and I, I didn't finish the story there despite the fact all these campaigns that, that we show you from half naked women to posters to schooling, still we haven't been able to curb the consumption. So I got some funding from Provost to look at, we've been monitoring heavy metals on sea turtles and, and the species that are being consumed. They have huge levels of cadmium and arsenic. So we were able to, to get funding to look at people consuming sea turtles, uh, and through a hair sample, you can measure those heavy metals. And so if we're able to link consumption with those heavy metals, um, then perhaps now we have a direct connection on that, and then go, go broad to other points. Uh, I can show that two more turtles to the community, and they said, am I, the first question is, am I gonna get this? So you know they're consuming sea turtle, right? Yeah, uh, I wish I can question, say, yeah, you're going to get one of those, but I can't because we know it's very specific to species. And that's the compl that what I want to bring about this group is the complexity to bring the cultural values into a community that has to change their ways to conserve a species. Um, yeah, sorry, um, I think that wasn't exactly. I, I was meaning more... Um, how do we enhance the networking to produce this kind of initiative, not, not specifically on, on turtles, but more um, for all, all the kind of threats you could imagine? And, and how I think the most important thing is, how do you think into those communities, for example, in developing countries, where uh, they may not have the, the skills to, to build an, an association and, and target a specific objective, and, and that could actually create an, an amazing network that you will be in contact with and will actually help you to see problems where you don't even see them. So I, th I think this can be used as a model for many species within your communities. I'm sure there are many examples. In fact, in the, in the new book, we mentioned at least four or five examples of communities working for a specific resource like Indonesia protecting wasps in, in rice fields. Uh, the, the monoculture uh, way of doing things was just cut the forest 
and get rid of everything else when you rely and then spray pesticides right to get rid of the aphids killing the rice when in fact if you left forest intact you will have the wasps that are parasitic to the aphids and you don't have to spray any pesticides in fact people shown that they can make up to ten thousand dollars within some a hectare uh, no a thousand dollars for a hectare of rice if without spraying and saving on pesticides just by protecting our species. So I guess we gotta go case by case basis and how to expand the model. Hi, Alonzo, thanks for your talk. Um, I was wondering, in the news recently, including in that re very recent Nature paper by Kevin Oliveall and colleagues, um, frequently part of the disease ecology message that gets pushed is the gravity of zoonotic diseases, zoonotic spillover potential, and specifically the fact that bats will apparently be the destruction of all humankind because they contain every virus we could ever catch. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the need for balance in messaging when it comes to talking about disease ecology and reservoirs in the right way, but in ways that don't terrify people for specific species that are reservoirs. That, that's having a huge issue, and uh, I used to work with that group before I moved to George Mason. Uh, and, and one of the issues is funding. So uh, funding has to do a lot with how, how organizations move forward. And that is, I say funding, because we got $75 million the first round, and they just got $110 million the next round uh, last year to look at the next pathogen coming from wildlife affecting humans. Did they predict and identify the next pathogen, the first $75 million? No, we, mer we miss MERS, we miss the Ebola outbreak but they still got more money. Uh, we looked at 200 samples of bats in Mexico. We found 12 new viruses. Yeah, but which one is going to be the one that's going to jump species? And so the issue is absolutely right. How can we balance conservation and then uh, health? Are bats the culprits of carrying all these pathogens that are going to spill into humans? or any wild animal uh, bringing uh, disease into humans, when in fact we have transmitted 57 different pathogens from humans to gorillas in Africa, just in ecotourism trips. So the issue is messaging and is the press. And so it's, it is hard, but we need to work more on the side of the wildlife, and that's one of the reasons I left Equal Alliance, was too, too human-oriented for me. Not that I don't like humans, but I prefer with animals, right? <laughs> Thank you, Liz. I think we're done. I think we're done. Thank you so much. <laughs>